In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst. This morning in the Gospel, which is always the Gospel before the Sunday of Nativity, we hear of the generations, these patterns of patriarchs, kings, priests, who form this pattern, the lineage of Jesus Christ. And within these patterns, there is this interesting thread. And I've spoken about this before, and this is always the thing that strikes me so powerfully in this, go- in this gospel reading, is this thread, this thread that is running through the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ. In these genealogy, there's only four women that are named. And these four women are Tamar, the Rahab, the Bathsheba, who, although not named, she's the wife of Uriah. So Bathsheba, and then the final one is Our Lady, the Holy Mother of God, the Theotokos, the Virgin Mary. Now, this red thread is a very literal thread in many ways, because that first woman who is named out of these four women out of these uh, decades of generations, Tamar was a woman who had been widowed, and according to the law, she was needing to be provided for an heir by her late husband's brother. And her late husband's brother, Onan, uh, decided not to provide an heir for her. And so this left her in despair. And so Tamar takes it upon herself to fulfill the law. And she essentially disguises herself as a woman of the night. And as she sees her father-in-law coming along the way, she basically arranges a trap, if you will, in which that he will provide for her the heir that the law is asking of her. And so the fruit of that trap, if you will, were the two sons, Perez and Zerah. Now, when Perez and Zerah, these twins, they came out, Zerah, you, many of you may know the story, Zerah put his hand forward first, and the midwife said, aha. And she said, unless we find out, you know, uh, so we can remember who comes first, she took a red thread and tied it around the hand of Zerah, and he pulls his hand back in. But lo and behold, who came out? It was Perez. It was Perez who came out first. And this is an interesting thing because this builds this first block of the red thread. You see, Tamar is this woman who, by our standards of morality, is not that great of a character. By our standards of morality, you could even say, why is she in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus? But I want to point something out to you because there's a thread running through all four of these women, actually. So first of all, let me just tell you this. The red thread is obvious in the sense that it's the incarnation of our Lord and it's salvation. And his salvation is promised in spite of the sins of his people. God's faithfulness is there in spite of the sins of the people. But let me get back now to talking about Zerat Perez. You see, what's interesting is that although Tamar, their mother, for morality, like I was saying, by our standards, is terrible, there's something, there's a redeeming quality in her, and that was obedience. You see, Tamar, she was not going to allow the law to be broken. This is the thing that she had. She needed to obey the law of God. And so, with all desperation, she does what she needs to do. And you see this theme in the Old Testament. Think about Esau and Jacob. How many times do you read the account of Esau and Jacob, you think to yourself, this is so weird that Jacob is the good guy. He's tricking and doing all these deceptive things. My brothers, my sisters, the gospel says to us, the Lord says to us in the gospel that 
The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. And so there's something about this right direction of the will that is laudable. Because this is what Tamar demonstrates to us, this obedience. And this obedience is what allowed her to be counted worthy to be part of the genealogy. Now let's go to the second woman, Rahab. Rahab is also a harlot. Rahab isn't even a Jew. And so when Jericho was being sieged, as you remember in the story, or you may not, the spies go into Jericho and they see Rahab and essentially they say to her, look, you've seen us. If you not only don't rat us out, but if you make a signal and you open the gate for us, your house will be spared, you and your house. And so they give Rahab a red rope a red thread, and they say, hang this from your window and you'll be spared. Again, Rahab, a woman who we look at by our conventional morality, not someone we should idolize, not someone who we think we should follow, but yet she's in the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what do we see with her? Just like Tamar, we see an obedience. We see an absolute unflinching obedience. And this is the thing that preserves her. Now, we move to Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. And when we look at Bathsheba, we can say, okay, Bathsheba, she was the wife of Uriah, who was the favored, one of the favorite generals of the Lord, uh, of King David. And David, in his sin, he takes her from Uriah. And I would submit to you, again, we see something, we see this threat, right? She is the mother of Solomon. But if you can imagine this, if Bathsheba had not have obeyed her king, what would have happened to her? You can imagine what would have happened to her. And so although she finds herself in very difficult circumstances, God preserves her, just like God preserved Rahab and just like God preserved Tamar. And that leads us to our Our Lady, the Holy Mother of God, who, unlike these other three women, is the perfect example of morality. And unlike these other three women, excuse me, and like these other three women, however, she also shares this quality of obedience. The Mother of God, when she hears the word proclaimed to her by Gabriel, in many ways, she's shocked and almost scandalized because she realizes, I've never known a man. How can this be? What will this mean? How will this reflect on me? How will this reflect on my betrothed? And yet she obeys. And all four of these women, we see this thread of obedience. And this obedience is ultimately the thing that God uses to incarnate. He comes through this red thread, going through all the genealogies. If you read the lives of these various kings, and priests and judges, you'll find disobedience over and over again in the men. Over and over again, disobedience in the men. Over and over again, they Mm -hmm. fail. But God chooses these four women. He chooses these four women for a particular reason. Because number one, it shows us that it's not by our strength, it's not our piety, it's none of those things that save us. It's God's work and His mercy alone. The second thing is it shows us is that even if we are failing, if we can hold to the thing that God gives us, God will give each and every one of you that one thing. If you can hold to that one thing and not be moved from that, you can be saved. My brothers and my sisters, the one thing that God was never moved from was his commitment to us, that he would become incarnate, that he would suffer all the humility of being born in a manger, being looked down upon by his kinsmen, ultimately suffering crucifixion, spitting, mocking, and shame. All of these things he prefigures for us. All these things he endures for us. All of these things for our love. But why? Because he loved us first. And so we see in these four women, in the genealogy of our Lord, the love of God working this amazing thread of obedience and love throughout generations.
May we have the obedience of these four women Tamar, Rahab, Bathsheba, but above all that, our Holy Lady. May we emulate her, not just in obedience, but also in purity of mind and heart. The prayers of our Holy Father, Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us. Amen. Amen.